What is up, everybody? If you've been following this channel for any amount of time, you know that I hate vulnerability scanning. They mostly are garbage tools that provide garbage results, that provide complete wastes of time for people to investigate false positives until their hands fall off or they quit and find another job that doesn't force them to endlessly fix meaningless vulnerabilities. And today I'm really excited because there's a tool called Oligo that has really been focused on this idea of runtime reachability. And until now, I haven't had the chance to go hands-on with the technology, so I'm really grateful that they've sponsored this video so that I can have a chance to actually use one of these tools that's saying runtime reachability is the answer to our woes and misery around this. So we're going to look at some different types of reachability analysis to see if they really do help solve the problems they claim to solve, which is trying to fix the flood, the deluge of vulnerabilities. And so today... Uh, we're going to dive right into using the Oligo platform and to take a look at what they can do and see if it's the magic sauce that we've needed all along. All right, so hopping directly in here to our testing repository, you'll notice I've buffed it up a little bit since the last time we looked at it. And the first issue that people are going to have when they think about these runtime solutions is how difficult is it to install. And really, I think there's a fundamental difference between Kubernetes-based agent deployments and non-Kubernetes-based agent deployments in the sense that it is really not that challenging to deploy an agent across Kubernetes because I think that security teams and security agents, honestly, have not quite caught up to the idea that you should treat pods as cattle and not as pets, which is just a way of saying that pods are meant to be short-lived ephemeral instances that can be wiped away at a moment's notice without impacting anything around them. And so the first thing to realize is that this was just a simple Helm install. So if I list my installs here, you'll see that all I did was Helm install the Oligo chart, and it just deployed as a daemon set across all of my nodes. And all of that means is that in this cluster, I have two nodes, and so you should see two copies of the sensor, right? Because the sensor goes on each node, and then these are a couple of different services that just run within the Oligo namespace to send them the telemetry data that they need. So this install is very easy. In fact, if you're not used to doing this, this is why I made this repo, which is just a simple Terraform to deploy a complete Kubernetes cluster that's very small, complete with setting up Helm and a Helm install, just so that if you're not used to using these tools, you at least have a way to get started with it. So for this video, we're really going to focus in on a couple of examples here. The first is this Python example that I have used many times before, and this is the same image that I used in the video I did talking about why container volumes suck, where I've got this Ubuntu image, I am installing a bunch of different Python and different packages just so that I can use Docker dependency in an exploit, and calling it in, and doing all of this Python-y stuff, and you'll see in this requirements. I actually have a bunch of requirements in this file that I don't use because they're intentionally older, so I can do some testing. Same with this insecure.js. I'm using an older node version, and then I am importing these two vulnerable dependencies, and I have this server set up that is actually getting attacked by both this Lodash vulnerability and the Semver vulnerability. So first, the Lodash vulnerability is just where someone can input a template and that template can run arbitrary code execution on the server if you're interpreting it directly. So that's the first attack. The second is a denial of service where we're using Semver, which is a versioning tool, to come in and it's asking for a version range. And if you push the regex to its limit, the time taken to respond increases without any limiting factor on it. So those are the two attacks that we have. So if I try to fix these, if I go into just Docker Scout again, which again, this isn't like against Docker Scout. This is just the way that if I run a Trivi scan, if I run any tools like that, I'm going to get the same results. And you will see here the vulnerabilities list is extensive. And if I go to fixable, it is still extensive. And the total pack, so 366 vulnerabilities. Obviously, if I were to try to go through these, it's going to take forever. And this is with the JavaScript one. And if I go into the Python one, we're in the same territory, 194 vulnerabilities. So in total, we're looking at 600 vulnerabilities. And to try to fix all of these, some of them are pretty simple, right? Like we talked about in that video, how rebuilding the image is actually what fixes the majority of fixable vulnerabilities. 
But beyond that, when we start getting into these types of dependencies, like th these versions of these dependencies are very old. And so actually trying to fix these is going to be a pretty major undertaking to try to upgrade these within larger projects. And so you want to make sure when you're coming to developers, what's my actual risk? What are things that I actually need to fix? And in this case, the reason we tested the way we did is we're pulling in a ton of dependencies here, but we are only vulnerable to Semver and Lodash. Like nothing else on this image is actually getting executed. So just to show that exploit, this is first loading up this JavaScript image. So the first is uh, console log here where this, this is going to log to the server console. So if I submit and then open up a new bash instance here and then look at the logs of this, you will see that it is logging to the server console because of the template execution that I did. And so that is an actual vulnerability. So from submitting that, I both executed the Lodash library and I executed the Semver one. And now if I hop into the Oligo dashboard, what's really cool is you can see all of these vulnerabilities across all of these active containers that I have. So the containers I'm using are the insecure.js, which is deployed, the insecure app, which is the Python one. These are different versions I was using for testing. And then this workload security evaluator image that we haven't talked about and same with BusyBox because it's not actually executing anything. So this one's not even loading. And so Oligo has done a great job at distilling to what has executed here. And here we see exactly correctly what has been executed, Lodash and Semver, the things that we actually want to fix. And then let's hop back in here and check out what's going on with this pod. So now in here, what's important about this is while these are SAST findings, these are not actually anything to do with SCA findings. So no amount of dependency patching is going to fix this because there are not vulnerabilities with like subprocess, for example. It's the way in which I'm using it. So we'll talk about this in the context of SAST findings. But all that to say that when we look at Docker Scout, for example, really none of these requirements issues are going to be fixable vulnerabilities. But that being said, from executing some stuff, I wanted to test if anything that we're doing is reliant on container dependencies. Because this is another benefit, I think, to Oligo's approach is that it doesn't draw this distinction right between the SCA stuff and the container vuln stuff in the sense that when I run these commands, even though I'm not executing any vulnerable dependencies from the context, I could be executing dependencies from in here or rather in here that are causing issues. So if we go back here and check on the executed on insecure app, we do see this libc vulnerability, but here we see that it's not fixable. So essentially, if I'm a developer, the only thing I care about are these high fixable executed vulnerabilities. Because of all of the other vulnerabilities in the normal execution of my app, because it, what's important to realize about vulnerabilities is there are some vulnerabilities that only exist under specific circumstances. And the best way to tell if those circumstances are happening is if the library is executed. And the big thing here that Oligo has over others is this executed versus loaded ability. Whereas loaded is going to show any dependency that's loaded into memory, which just means that it's installed on the system or it's potentially available to be used. And sometimes you do want to go ahead and check those as just additional protections for like if someone got onto a pod, things they could potentially do from there. But you'll see here that these, these vulnerabilities are the exact ones we called out because they're the ones I wrote exploits for because they're the ones that are actually exploitable in the context of which they're being used because it's the normal function of the application to have it be executed. And so that is the main focus of Oligo is really from this, I can just take it out to my teams. Hey, we need to fix IO Dash and Semver. And, and an additional thing that's cool is that these vulnerabilities that it's showing for executed but not fixable, these are actually cool vulnerabilities to know about. It's not like a total waste of time. One of them has to do with the generation of long passwords can cause a denial of service. So it's something to keep in mind if we were using these pods to generate SSH tokens, that's potentially an issue, but obviously we're not doing that. But in the weird case where we were, this would be vulnerable to that. And this, if we were using this specific library to do some random number generation we again would actually be vulnerable to it. So that's just another way to say that with Oligo, even when I'm investigating something, 
and it is something without a fix. So first of all, I would never send this to a developer because there's nothing they can do about it. But what's cool about it is I can actually get meaningful data where this, this would actually be a vulnerability if we were using it in this way. So I need to think about, are we using this to do this? And in this case, we're obviously not using the library to do either of these attacks. And so it makes sense. But I think this is actually a legitimate solution to reducing total vulnerability count and making this stuff more doable. So this really comes across in this Python image where everything's been shown as reprioritized to low. Even though the original score is critical, obviously I'm importing these things, but I'm not even using them. And this really forces me to change the way that I think about vulnerabilities holistically in the sense that I'm very used to the idea that researching vulnerabilities is just inherently a waste of time. But with, when it comes to these executed ones, it actually isn't always a waste of time because it, I could be using these things in a way that, where they would actually be vulnerable. So it's worth actually thinking about the context of how these things are used. Here, I'm going to try out running a workload security tester and just see how Oligo handles it. I went into the pod and ran just a few of the different tests that exist within the atomic testing and immediately these start showing up as executed libraries within the tool so again this is a different use case because this is like someone going into the pod and executing things but you can see how quickly this is updating where i i would know where to focus because for most applications what i want to really highlight here is that things are not changing that often as far as which dependencies are actually being executed. So for this Python app, I'm not executing anything with any vulnerabilities because it's just Flask. So I can come in here and see that Flask is executed. And so there's even a, an amazing little ability here to see which libraries am I actually executing. And if I wanted to go down this route, I could even try to figure out how to prioritize some of the open source risk in general. Because you can see there's actually not that many libraries that are in use. And I could actually go ahead and see, okay, well, do we want to be using Flask? Uh, do we want to be using Jinja? These types of things. And really, this just gives you a level of insight to do investigation in a way that isn't really possible in other tools where you're just, again, looking at this giant mess of packages, of vulnerabilities. You don't really know where to focus. It's totally overwhelming to know where to go. But even here, like this is this is a level of detail that I never thought that I would want in a tool because I never thought I'd have time to dig into some of this stuff. But when all you have is a single non-fixable, non-applicable vulnerability. So here I would configure Jira and mark this as a ignored issue, right? Once I've done that, there's no other findings really here that are even applicable to what's going on. So Really, uh, it's hard because a lot of what Oligo is selling, right, is a lower number. When people are evaluating tools, it's easy to get fixated on this, like, oh, well, it found 1,200 vulnerabilities. And Oligo is seeing everything, but it really just provides you a level of insight that makes container scanning cool again. So a button here that I never thought I would actually be excited to see is this export SPOM and VEX button. And the reason I'm excited to see that is a lot of my work history is in smaller companies where all you're trying to do is actually increase security by fixing the most relevant vulnerabilities to fix. But in more regulated environments, you need to create what are called VEX statements, which are granular CVE by CVE level exemptions to why you're making a decision to either ignore or change something. So here you can see my Oligo SBOM here. And we're going to look at the VEX statement. And so this is really the core piece is this analysis. And the state is we're not affected by this vulnerability. And the justification is that the code is not reachable. So here, if we pull up the CVE where we are actually reachable, we can see that we are exploitable and our response is going to be to update the package. So this is really a massive time saver if you are in a more regulated industry where you have to have a line by line CVE by CVE example. And a lot of companies are currently only giving you an SBOM and selling that as though they're actually like doing you a favor or something. But you can see how crazy this document would be if I sent this somewhere and they just saw all these CVEs and it didn't have a VEX statement showing analysis per one. And there's some companies where you have people manually analyzing each one of these CVEs to see if they're affected or not. So really what we've done with just this simple VEX statement is taken our SCA and our container vulnerability scanning results and gone from 1,200 down to having to explain about 20 in total across our images. 
And that really makes, first of all, things a lot more doable from a patching perspective, but also from a regulatory perspective, we are automating. And if, if we check with auditors beforehand to validate the approach of showing that we're only vulnerable to something if it is actually an executed library, and Oligo will show that over time, right? If a library does execute at some point, it will get added into the report, we'll see it, we'll be able to address it. So it, it even helps with tackling these complicated compliance use cases where you really need VEX statements to show uh, that you're in compliance with difficult regulatory environment. To return then to the question where we started, is there a way to make container scanning cool, to make image scanning actually helpful? I think Oligo really has done a lot of it. I would be very interested to deploy this in my own production environment to see what it's doing. But as far as combining SCA and container vuln scanning, showing, helping you focus on what actually is exploitable, it really, for so long, I've pushed against the idea that digging into CVEs is even helpful compared to just patching everything. But Oligo is reducing the scope of the findings to such an extent that it's viable to actually think about the vulnerabilities that are there and to triage them. When you're getting a 98% reduction in noise, you can actually quantify and think about how to spend your time and even get things done. So I'm super impressed with this technology. I think it's really great. My verdict then is that runtime reachability is not a gimmick, and I was ready very much for it to be a gimmick. So thanks for tuning in. <laughs>